So hello, Melanie, and I am so delighted to have you here. I've given you a little bit of an introduction, but probably not even done you justice. So I would love for you to, before we get into a topic of talking about authenticity, please fill in the gaps for my listeners and tell us how you got here. Okay, thank you. So how I got here is a very long story. I will try to keep fairly succinct, but I have been connected to spirit my entire life. There was never a time that I was not. Growing up, I thought that everyone had this experience. I would walk to school talking to my spirit guides, and I would know things about other people instantly that other children couldn't understand. And I was always the weird kid because of that. And it wasn't until probably in my teenage years when I started sharing more openly my experiences, Um, you know, I'd go to a party and I'd say to the person beside me, your grandmother just walked in and wants to talk to you and sharing, you know, spirit messages. I started studying tarot and religion um, more in depth. And that's when I, I realized, oh, wait a minute, this isn't everyone's experience. And that was a real eye opener for me. And so at first it was really cool and people were fascinated by it, but I found as I got older and went to university and started, I guess, mingling with different crowds, it started to become aware, or I became aware that it wasn't always accepted. And it was something that I started to hide from people. And honestly, I completely shut down by the time I was probably 25. And I started in a career in finance, did not at all want to use my gifts or my intuition. And then when my second child was born, when I was in my early 30s, she actually had a demon attached to her. And the only way that I was able to help her was to open all of that back up. And that was like my rebirth, so to speak. And I know it's crazy. (laughs) You can't see it, but my jaw just dropped. (laughs) Yeah. And then through that experience, um, I had to stand in my power to protect her. I had to, you know, call everything back in order to fight for her. It literally was a fight that took years. And it was a beautiful experience that I had a newfound love for my abilities, for my connection, for what I could do, for how I could help. And then I ended up leaving finance and doing that for a living from that point forward. Wow, Melanie. And again, if you're listening to this, you may have missed like my my reactions because this just blows my mind. Um, so many questions come to mind. Where do I start? Um, first <laughs> of all, um, how did you recognize this demon being attached to your newborn. So I didn't recognize it. Uh, It was really interesting. I had a very challenging time with my eldest and I would pray to God and I'm not a religious person, but I would pray to God through my whole pregnancy. Please just give me three months of peace so I can get my bearings. That was my mantra. And when she was born, perfect child, didn't fuss, didn't cry, slept great. And it was like when she hit three months, someone flicked a light switch and it was colic and screaming and she wouldn't settle. And I, I thought it was, you know, something I was eating or I wasn't helping her sleep properly. And this went on for years. And as she became a toddler, she had this crazy strength. Like she would be able to pick up furniture and throw it across the room. And there would be times when I would have to ask my husband to peel her off of me because I couldn't handle her strength, just really strange things. And she would, her eyes would glaze, glaze over. And you could tell that she wasn't there anymore. And she would act differently. And this continued until she was four. And again, cutting out a lot of the the, the details. But I said to my mother, I said, I can't do this anymore. Like I cannot deal with this. And none of us were connected to our spirituality at this point in time. Like I said, we had blocked it all off. And she said, well, I've heard about this person who had a friend who went to this shaman and let me 
get her a session with the shaman. So sorry, your mom was open to like spiritual because you said we closed it up at that time. So your mom was very spiritual as well up until not, the point, I guess when she closed it. Not spiritual, but very curious. Okay. So being psychic and being a medium definitely runs in the family, but I did not find any of this out until I was in my (laughs) forties because no one talked about it and everyone shut it down. Yeah. So my mother did not really explore that herself in life, but absolutely has supported me in that exploration. If that makes more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So that's good because that means you had someone on your side, not someone who goes, you know, that's crazy or you're making things up or, you know, everything's fine. She's just a baby. Like you you had support, at least in your mom. That sounds, that's amazing. For sure. And so I called this shaman and he said, I'm going to work on her when she's sleeping and I'm going to remove the demon. And then you have to do all of this work. And it was like a binder. It's almost like he knew I needed to come back to myself because I, I trust he could have done all of that, but he gave me the work to do with her going forward. And when she woke up the next day, she was a different child. So it wasn't me that found it. I had blocked everything off, but the gift that the shaman gave both of us was removing that and then bringing me back to what I was meant to do. Oh, this is so beautiful. Such a beautiful um, intro into this topic about authenticity because, you know, the top, like, I mean, even discussing that your child, there was something not quite right with your child and or appeared right and it wasn't your typical um physical thing that you can take to the doctor and the doctor will prescribe something but you step out of perhaps a comfort box and went to see a shaman so sharing that thank you so much because that is not only very I would imagine vulnerable but you know your honesty to me that's like oh this is leading us into how authentic you are that this is what happened and you're sharing it But also what I love is that you received from your shaman a lot of deepening practices, as I call it, a lot of homework. (laughs) Homework, for sure. (laughs) I love that because the thing is, yes, like you said, he possibly knew this is what you need to open you up. But I find as well, and, and I've worked with a shaman for myself as well, but even when I work with clients, that spirit always gives us, you know, deepening practices, right? Homework. And that part is quite important. And often um, I find that we tend to skimp over this. Go like, well, I received this healing. I'm feeling great now. Obviously, you know, that's done. I didn't have time for this. You know, like, I don't want to do this. I'll get to it. And then I feel like people often don't realize that um, that is a part of it. Like, that is to help integrate stuff, you know. Like, I feel like we need to, and I got homework from my shaman as well, right? So I love that you mentioned that. But now the question that pops into my mind is actually, if we can go back to you being in finance, because Mm -hmm. that is very very much the opposite so far away from how you grew up and what you believed and what you saw what you did right I mean finance could not be more analytically minded more left brain of a job how was that for you how did you feel being in that field and using your analytical mind so I don't have a problem with the analytical side I am actually very much both. I'm very spiritual and I'm very analytical at the same time. But I actually, I did very poorly in finance, according to my managers. (laughs) And the reason being is that every time a client would come into my office and I was supposed to sell them a mortgage, you know, sell them an RSP, whatever it was that the, the deal of the month was, we were pushing whatever product. And I refused to do that. I wanted to help people. So my clients would come in and I would spend hours with them creating a budget that worked within, you know, their money range, um, teaching them how to get out of debt, not trying to sell them additional products. So my clients loved me, but I made no money for the bank. 
So that didn't go over very well. And it ended up being very stressful because I was conflicted between doing what I was hired to do and actually helping people. And I ended up having a nervous breakdown and I left. Wow. And if that wasn't enough of a sign to say you are very much out of your alignment, yes. right? you're not being authentic fully here. Because, exactly. yeah, because it's one thing to recognize that, yeah, I am both analytically minded and intuitively minded or spiritual. But it's another to be in a career where clearly you can't bring yourself to do what you're being asked to do because it feels very much conflicting, you know, and it doesn't feel right for you. Yes. Um, and it's interesting because listening to this there, I'm like, ah, hello, of course you were being shown you were in the wrong field, but we don't know that when we are in the midst of it, right? Like we don't see the forest for the trees. How was coming back to or opening up your gifts again? What did that feel like for you? Oh my goodness. I don't think anyone has ever asked me that before. I think it felt like freedom, like giving myself the freedom, the permission to just be me instead of constantly. I mean, I can remember as a kid, we moved around a ton. So I was always the new kid, always trying to fit into the mold, right? To make friends. And then being in finance, it was trying to show up to what my manager expected of me when it, my body was screaming at me, right? This is not for you. And I could finally take off that mask and drop the BS and just explore who I was like, come back to that because I'd forgotten after so long. So it was really the freedom and the permission to explore myself without judgment and without limits. It felt amazing. It felt amazing. As opposed to being in finance for you. This was out <laughs> of alignment. Yeah. And it's, it's nothing against finance. I mean, we need no. people to do, that. but it just but wasn't it was, you. It wasn't me. No, it wasn't. And it wasn't even the work that wasn't me. It was the people that I was around and it was the, the environment, the energetic environment, right? The energy coming off of everyone there yeah, was just yeah. much for me. And that's the other thing. I didn't realize my limits. I didn't realize I had to have strong boundaries as an empath, as a psychic, you know, as an energy worker, I just wanted to help people. And I didn't understand that if I didn't take care of myself first, that wasn't going to happen. So there's yeah, all of these yeah. layers of things just piling up and it just became too much. Well, it didn't become too much. It was perfect, right? Because I needed to leave and I wasn't listening. So my body made sure that I had to leave. Yeah, yeah. The sequence, the synchronicities, the sequence of events is is amazing how they played out for you. But like, I guess what else? What I'm trying to sort of also figure out here as I'm listening to you, Melanie, is like, how do we know we are being authentically ourselves? Because like now. We are being bombarded by social media. I, you know, like, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, sometimes we tend to scroll through Instagram and it feels to us like, you know, nourishing and it feels to us like we're filling a cup, like this, wow, like when I see something that inspires me, I mean, hello, crochet and knitting and colours and all that <laughs> stuff, right? But we also numb ourselves because we we feel like we are, you know, supposed to live up to, you know, like if someone has a perfect house and has five kids and looks gorgeous and looked after. And so we then feel inadequate and we feel like, is this me? Should I be like that? Like, how do we know when we are being our authentic self? So I think the simplest way to put it is to follow your joy. If it feels good, do more of that. If it doesn't feel good, question why that is. Is it because I'm exhausted and I need help? Maybe this something is in alignment, but I just don't have the capacity for it right now. Or is it that I'm choosing to do this because my friends are doing it or because it's, you know, the current thing that is cool to do, like with the house, do I feel really good? 
in a house that's completely put together? Or do I feel better, you know, with toys on the floor and a pile of laundry? Cause that feels safe and cozy. Like who knows? Right. And it's just allowing yourself again, that space, that freedom and that space to explore what feels good to me. We've that lost is- touch with that. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me about this, as you're saying this, is because I was thinking back to my childhood, my teenage years, and I loved like all this stuff that now would be considered eclectic, you know, like mismatched, didn't like even my clothes, like I didn't ever, I watch my daughter now and she's so put together, like, you know, this girl has style, but like I got like at 14, me, I was wearing like these galaxy bright colored leggings with let's say some silly secondhand green top nothing matched shoes didn't match the hair whatever like you know and then I kind of was dropped because very much like you we moved around so I was always a new kid I always had to like try to fit in and then like at some point we were at the school where all the girls it felt like so when I grew up in Europe we didn't have to wear uniforms so everyone brought their own styles and I just was so lost I was like I don't know I felt like I should be like this and that me being so let's say colorful (laughs) and as I thought not put together um was bad and you know that's why kids don't want to you know hang out with me or we're laughing or whatever I was picked on I should be more like that I should have this perfect hair and you know and so when you're saying this like um how do we let go of let me think how I want to ask this how can we stand in our authentic self, even if our authentic self doesn't fit into what we see on a day-to-day basis? Like if I'm this colorful, collective thing, but then it runs into grace and whites and, you know, put together, like how can I still remain myself? Okay. Well, I don't think that we are meant to fit in. That's the key, right? Being authentic is being unique is bringing that vibration, that unique expression of energy that only you can bring to this universe. That's so valuable and so rare. And the truth is that it's uncomfortable to do that. And I'm not going to say even at the beginning, it feels a little uncomfortable, but then you get used to it and you don't care. Like when I see these women saying, oh, I don't care what people think of me. I call BS on that. If you have an open heart and you truly are looking to connect with others, that's going to hurt. How can it not? So I think it's getting realistic about it is going to feel uncomfortable to be different, but that doesn't mean there's going to or not going to be all of these beautiful gifts and pleasures and joys that come along with it. And what I have found is that as I deepen more and more into who I truly am, I lose more friends. Sometimes I lose family members. I have a smaller group of people, but then that's the calling card for the people who really resonate with me, who are like me, who want to be around my authentic self. That's how they can find me. So at this point in my life, I have a very small group of people, but they are amazing and perfect for the exact brand of weird that I happen to be. So there's no more need to hide that. Yeah. Yeah. It's considered a positive, not a negative. It's like you're, it's like you're describing me to a T. Um, Because like what I, like I have very much like you reopened, you know, my abilities and everything and have chosen to go down this path. I literally tell people I hear voices. Right, I speak to, you know, people, things that you can't see, beings that you can't see. And I have people in my life, I mean, I have lost as well, family, friends, and some were painful. And I still have people in my circle that are here, but they don't agree with what I do. And I love the 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 difference that we bring into each other's lives because we need those people as well right who are willing to love us and accept us but they don't necessarily love this it's not their thing they are different 
because they bring a certain perspective with a little bit of maybe grounding, even a little bit of certainty that we are so solid in our beliefs. But I would trade this for the world. Like this, even though I've lost family, friends, I literally have to put myself out there like I've never put myself out there. I've done a million things in my life and I was never so solid and openly talking about, like, yep, this is me, this is what I do, like with this. So to me, that's the sign like, oh, Kasha, you have come home. This is you, right? Yes. And this is you and this is what you do. And I can stand on, on the roof and say that. But even though we're here doing this, there's many spiritual people mm-hmm. doing it. We are all kind of like here to be sparks for each other. And yet we have our unique gift and unique message. But what I have noticed in social media or thanks to social media is that some spiritual people, and I don't know whether it's newbies, new to this, or maybe new to a business, new to social media, they tend to kind of copy each other Mm -hmm. and I don't know whether this is because they're still trying to figure out their path, their voice, their thing, or but how do you see this? Do you have you experienced that? Absolutely, I have. And it's one one of the things I think is a bit of a problem within the spiritual community, what we'll call the spiritual community. I mean, that can mean so many different things. But I think because most of us find this path through a lifetime of uncomfortable situations of healing of shifting there's not really a school you can go to (laughs) you can't go and get a four-year degree in being (laughs) a psychic you know you can't there's no one to really teach us because so much of this has been hidden I mean if we look back to the witch trials we have been taught as women powerful women to hide our gifts to not talk about it to hide that light that even in this day and age, there are so many people that are afraid to be honest about it, that we we kind of fumble and find our own way. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we really latch on when we do find or see someone, oh, oh, she's like me, or he's like me, and I can relate to that. And we tend to take that on, maybe not even consciously, but take that on as our own. And we'll even use terms like, oh, I'm mirroring that person, or they're showing me that part within myself. And we can get all caught up in this spiritual lingo. And honestly, I don't think half of the people even understand what they're talking about. And so they just follow what is shown to them, not because they're trying to copy, I don't think, but because they're lost. And they're looking for deeper meaning and they're trying to figure out what is it within myself? What I hear the most from my clients? What is my purpose on this planet? Oh, so Does beautiful. that make sense? I'm yes. saying that. Yes. And I love the way you're putting this in words because it sounds, it, it sounds like it's coming from a place of love and not, um, for lack of a better word, um, analytical place, you know, like when you think about business gurus, you know, uh, marketing gurus that are very much about strategies and systems, you know, someone who um, mirrors you or, or, you know, imitates you or copies you is straight away labeled in a certain way and is kind of put into a certain box and it's almost like that judgment comes straight away in. And there's no understanding, I feel, to, yeah, this person is just trying to figure out who they are, what their gifts are, you know, and they either will or they will realize that's not my area. I have a gift, but I need to use it in a different way. And I love that um, because I feel very much like that too, but I love that you are articulating it like that for us because it just brings a little bit more positivity to a very saturated area of social media whether it's women entrepreneurs whether it's uh, even a spiritual arena at the moment um so I love that I love I love that but I feel like I've cut you off so if there's anything else you wanted to add to that sorry Melanie I I don't think you cut me off at all. I think what is coming forward for me as you're speaking about this with the business specifically 
is that when we work with a business coach, for the most part, we are given a formula. You want to start a business. You want to make, you know, five figure months, six figure years. There's this like hierarchy of these steps that we are expected to get to. And we are given a template of how to make that happen for us. There's no bigger block to authenticity that I can think of. Mm. You found what you want to do. You want to share yourself with the world. Now go and pay someone else to tell you specifically what that's going to look like and how you're going to do it. That's not yeah. authenticity. That's yeah. you following a formula. Yeah. And it's the exact opposite of what we need to do. Right. So I think a lot of, I don't even want to say it's blame because I don't think blame comes into it. But a lot of the reason why that's happening is because we're told we're supposed to do it like everybody else, because that's how we get success. And further to that, this is what success looks like. It looks like a million dollars a year. There's no talk about fulfillment, about having time for yourself, work-life balance, incorporating your family or your children's needs. It's just about this is what you do to get to here, and then you're a success. Mm, I love that. Yes. Um, Because to me, it feels like the more we are connected to our intuitive self, our higher self, however we want to call it, not necessarily the shoulds, must, you know, what is right, what is wrong, the analytical, the left brain, the, you know, the conditioning pattern. But the more we are connected to our intuitive self, to our soul, the more authentic we are being because you you get to do business your way yes. and it feels it's going to be so different, right? We all have unique gifts. My One of my wise, wise teachers always said, uh, actually, she, she told me, Kasha, yes, a psychic, it's been in your family, you're a healer, but don't think you're special. You're not special. You're unique, but you're not special. We're all unique. And that kind of stuck with me because I was like, yeah, you know, like if I say to someone, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know, I can read tarot or like, you know, um, you know, you do have mediumship skills. It doesn't mean that we're better. It doesn't mean that we are somewhere up here. It just means that's a gift. That's a skill. And now let's feel into this. How am I going to use this? And I know people who have these gifts who have gone through pretty much their whole adult life not working in it, right? My mom was like that too. They didn't, they never activated it. They never actually worked in it for whatever reasons, right? And so mm-hmm. um, I think if you recognize that you have, and we're talking specifically, I guess, about psychic gifts or abilities because, or spiritual gifts because, you know, this is sort of kind of like, I guess, the field that we're in. But whatever skills you have, you know, even if you learn how to do something, then you go and make it your own. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, Melanie, do you teach any programs? Like, do you teach anything? I do have quite a few courses that I have taught live in the past that are incorporated into community. I have, um, I have one about spiritual development, but my favorite one, it's called the awakened human project. And honestly, this is the work I think we all need to do is coming back to what it means to be human. Like we are spirits. We have spiritual parts to us. I understand, or at least I believe that we are essentially a spiritual being, but the whole reason we choose to incarnate in human form is to be in this body and to have the human experience. And that to me is the most spiritual thing you can do. Well, I want you to, I want you to talk a little bit more about your programs in a minute, but let me tell you why I asked, because I, I don't know whether your experience has been like this, but I feel, so I have this program, Liberate, right, where I teach you, like, the psychic development. And it can be so easily misunderstood that the practices, the tools that you're learning, that's it. That's what I take, and I go and recreate and teach others. Like, that's my power. But actually, the power is 
the the ability to connect, the ability to all of a sudden open up your your intuitive gifts to strengthen, to recognize, you know, to be able to go into the Akashic Records. And then you take this ability and you go and make whatever you you feel is good for you as opposed to kind of thinking, oh, I've learned mirror work or whatever. So now let me go and recreate it, right? And it's often so misunderstood. And I was wondering whether like you give tools and and practices maybe or you make us aware of some practice in your programs. And then let's say a participant would think, oh, I've learned this cool practice. Let me go and teach someone else that, right? Like it's kind of, I feel like limiting and missing the point because that practice is only to help you open up your channel. And then right. you go and do amazing things with it. There's no telling what you can do. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. Oh, God, we are like, ah, there's so much. Well, that's, <laughs> if I, I think I understand what you're saying, and I agree. And that's why I don't teach any of my programs live anymore, because it's not, it's not about me showing you how to do something. It's about me creating the sacred space where you feel safe enough to explore yourself and then share that with the world. I can't teach you that. I'm not you. You know better than I do what your special gift is. And it's just helping women find that confidence and that space and that understanding to really find what is unique, to find that authentic part of themselves that is so radically different from me. That's what I want to celebrate. And that's what I focus on now is how can I create the space for that to happen and cheer you on? That's incredible. Well, please tell us, like, what are you doing like now? Like, how can, like, how, how do you support, how do you help your clients? Like, what do you think is your authentic gift that you give to others? So it's, it's kind of circular here in what we're talking about, but I Which think. Which is like, so perfect because you told me before we hit record that you are like this open, you know, vessel and you, you don't believe, you don't limit yourself. You don't believe that there are limits, you know, to like right or wrong and stuff. So I love it. This is, this feels really good. Yeah. So I believe my biggest gift and why I am here is to literally just be myself. And that means showing up in my pajamas and without makeup on and messing things up and not apologizing for it. And just, I feel like I can serve as an example of how I am incredibly flawed and I am doing this so imperfectly and I'm still enough and I'm still valuable and I'm still worthy of helping others along the way. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be an expert. And then whatever you do, whatever the person who's working with me is being called to do, then that gives them the permission to go for it and not have to be a huge success, to not have to have everything lined up perfectly and to fail and to learn and then to move forward. Well, I need to ask a question now because you've mentioned something that I know my listeners will want to know more about you okay. said that you don't mind showing up in your pajamas with no makeup you recognize that you're flawed now I yeah. have clients who are trying to get their business going or trying to you know like start something but <laughs> always say I need to get my ducks in a row first or I can't do it till then and I guess where is the line or should we draw a line between ready, not ready, perfect, not perfect, professional, being myself. Because I love that you do that because I relate. Like if I see you on on a live and I see you in your jammies and, you know, whatever, no makeup, I'm like, ah, that's my girl. I can listen to you, right? You're inviting me and I like the vibe. Um, But how if I was – wanting to start something now but I feel all conflicted like there's no possible way I can do this no possible way I can show up unless I have all my ducks in a row what would you say so I don't think that we're ever ready I I mean we could have a whole podcast on what is ready (laughs) right what does that even mean I sure as hell don't feel ready I've been doing this professionally for 12 years I'm not ready yet I'll let you know if and when I ever get there um it's a practice 
every day in my life, I show up as me and then I show up in my business in that way. It's a constant evolution. And what I have to offer today is different than what I had to offer three years ago. It's going to be different another three years from now. And I don't have to control that. And the reason why I think that is essential to having success, and when I say success, I mean joy and pleasure and whatever it is that is important to you in your life, is because that is the only way to serve the people who you are meant to help. If I show up with my hair done and say a business suit on and I'm all polished and I'm professional and know exactly what I'm going to talk about, people aren't going to resonate with that because they're going to feel there is a disconnect between the image I am showing and who I truly am. Now, if having everything put together perfectly is your jam, then you do need to show up that way because then you will call in the other people who want to have everything put together, who feel better, more themselves when everything is done. That's just not who I am. So it's not that my way is better at all, but it's key that you show up being honest with yourself first. And if I am, you know, kind of good at this one thing, but I know that I can help others with it, I'm going to show up there. And those people who need me will want to work with me. The people who look at me and go, oh my God, she's in her pajamas. Oh, they're not my people. I can't help them. And that's okay because they are going to be attracted to the person who can help them. And again, that's going to change throughout the years for everyone. Does that make sense? So beautifully said, Melanie. And anyone listening to this, I hope you are absorbing every single word that Melanie has shared here with us around this and I hope that if you are wanting to share your gift your work start your business but you're thinking as soon as or I first have to do this or I have to have my ducks or camels or whatever in a row you know I hope that Melanie has given you the permission slip signed with undersigned with my name as well that you will never be ready. There will never be all the ducks in the row. And the best time is really to start now because always, I always feel, you know, this work, it's not about us. It's not no. about, when we're sharing this gift, it's not about us. It's about like the people that are out there looking for us, right? And when you are sitting here thinking, well, I have to have the perfect background. I have to have a better camera first. Or I need to you know, get my makeup first. Oh, well, now it's too late. I can't go live. You're actually doing a disservice to the people that are waiting for you to turn on your light, your camera, whatever it is, and just be you. And I always love the authentic be you. I'll take the pajama, no makeup um, person over the fully perfectly, you know, in a suit put together person with like a PowerPoint presentation in this blank room, <laughs> right? Like I'll take it because I don't connect to that. I don't know what this is, you know, like we're humans. Yes. I love that you shared that with us. So Melanie, is there anything that I didn't ask that you wish I asked you? I feel like I really would like to have a comment here, but I just love where our conversation went, to be honest. I feel like whatever needed to be said we went there we might have to have another episode and talk about the tinfoil love because <laughs> I would love to <laughs> I would love that I would love that yeah that's a that's probably one of the things about being my authentic self that has been the most challenging oh, is share. sharing my views on the world and especially on what's been happening the past few years yeah and it's been yeah. and I think that what has been happening the last I don't know two years or so um I think we needed that sort of wake up call whether you were you know believing that your nine to five job is perfect and secure and all of a sudden turns out not whether you were waiting for something else to kind of shake you up before you get going or make that change or take that leap of faith and all of a sudden you have no choice and you have to you know, but also seeing who your people are and who are the people that are not really your people because this has divided us, right? So um, I love 
in a crazy way what the last two years have done to us and the snowball effect that we have received. I think we need to have another episode and talk about some. Uh, I would love that. <laughs> uh, Elliot, I was saying to Melanie before we hit record because Melanie um, is uh, probably a good person to talk to about aliens as well. And aliens is something, so I can channel um, soul groups, but I mm-hmm. often say that for me, I do that because I want to know how this information can help my client, how knowing that they are Pleiadian or Syrian can help them. What I really would like to do is dive into what actually is the history? What has been happening? Like, how is the connection between reptilians and, you know, people here? But I always say, this is like my summer reading. You know, like, at school, you get the books that you have to read. And then there's the books that you're like, oh, I can't wait for some. I'm going to dive into it. I don't, I, I've got to get through this now. But these <laughs> are the books. And there will come a time where I will have enough time to kind of dive into that. But I love anyone who has anything to share about aliens or anything. Yeah. So we the will have thing, Yeah. I was going to say, the one thing that I will say that I have been told is that they prefer to not be called aliens. Oh, really? It's kind of a derogatory term to them. Really? So what, what is a better uh, word? E.T. Okay. E.T. Extraterrestrial. It's an easy one. Intergalactic being. And so it could now be you have al- to explain why alien isn't a good word. Why is that? Well, I never asked why, to be honest. It's just when, and I don't speak with them on a regular basis. I don't connect with any one particular group of energy it's just whoever is needed for each client comes through. Um, but it was just, it was brought up to me one day and I took note and I try to be respectful of yeah. requests like that. Yeah. So yeah, I just call them ETs now. ETs. There you go. Now I know. Um, thank you for sharing this. This was actually a really uh a really juicy nugget that you left us there with. Um <laughs> <laughs> so I would love if you, if I mean, if you still can, if you have time to please pull a card for us. What is the message for the collector? What cards are you using, Melanie? Oh, these are my favorite oracle. It's called Vessel. And the reason why I love them, we spoke a little bit about this before we recorded, but I really like for getting personal messages to have as little information as possible printed on the card or attached to the card so that I can receive the message from spirit. And these cards simply have one word on them and then a simple hand drawing. And I just feel that the messages are more personal that way. Are you the kind of person who uses the book that comes with it when you pull a card? (laughs) have you seen like some people do that and I'm thinking I've always ever since like even before I you know like did cards live I was thinking well what's the point I can do that right like so I even teach it I'm like now we're chucking the book away like read through it and then put it away when I teach it's exactly the same way and if I can just speak to that for a second is that okay yeah yeah The reason why is we'll take tarot, for example, because there are very specific meanings for every card. But if I pull a card and let's say I get the page of pentacles and then I read that book and I get that exact message, I'm not saying that that would be incorrect. There is going to be a, what I would call a hook in that card, in that message, but it's probably just a gateway, just an opening for where you are actually meant to go to receive the truth that is meant for you. And if you just read the book, it's like you're closing that door. You're getting this tiny little morsel of information. And if you are open to all possibilities of what that card could mean, you're going to get a more accurate, a more detailed, a more resonant message that could Mm. actually have nothing to do with what is written in that book. So for me, tarot, oracle, pendulums, runes, any of those spiritual tools, they're not the end game in themselves. When we use them properly, 
It is just a way to help us connect to our own wisdom, our own intuition, which is where the true magic lies, in my opinion. I like that. I share that as well. Yeah. yeah, it feels to me, it feels like cards are like these little prompt cards, you know, like they kind of play charades and they are Pictionary and they're like, here's the thing. And then that activates. And the more we talk, the more, you know, it comes through. And I feel, I don't know about anyone else, but from my own experience, I feel like it is um, like your guides, my guides are giving me information, but you may not want this now like you may not want me to talk about let's say a relationship because you want to focus on this so then they won't go there but if you say oh actually can you tell me more how this relates to my husband or my relationship then it's almost like more comes through yes and then what about even pulling a card the same card for two different people and reading that same description right they're two different people (laughs) it's not going to work Anyway, sorry, here is Melanie. So I have the card that I pulled and what I asked was what message do we need to hear those of us who are connected in the podcast today or whenever we're listening in order to connect more to your authentic self? Okay. And is there the video going to be shared at all? Uh, yes, we can do that. I was going to ask. share the card. (laughs) I didn't know if I needed to share it. So the card that came forward is begin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just going to tune in and see what our guides want to (laughs) share. So honestly, it's like, they're just mirroring what you were saying earlier. Just start where you are. The best way to show up into your true authentic self is to just begin loving yourself where you are actually. And they're suggesting a practice, if any of your listeners want to try this, of making a list of three things that you consider a flaw. Maybe you're too loud. Maybe you're weird. Maybe you talk to dead people, right? (laughs) Whatever it is, to make a list of the three things that you feel are just not your best qualities. And then sit with that and just see if you can learn to accept those things. And that in doing that practice, the gifts within them will start to open up. Wow. It's fabulous. Yeah. I've never done that before, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. That feels sure really that. good for me as well. But it's just that whole idea of our magic, our unique gifts truly are in what we typically think are our flaws. Like with me, like being the weird kid. I was always weird and hated being weird. Now I love being weird Mm -hmm. and me allowing that to shine through is how I'm able to do the work that I do. Wow. Powerful. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we, I think through that practice, I'm thinking of a couple of things. I feel like it's almost, I will have a chance to, dance with it a little bit get to know you know that that flaw or that thing that I perceive as a flaw and perhaps that will breed familiarity which then will lead to loving it right yes it's nothing yeah. it's like my eclectic clothes now I go like oh my gosh I look at these people now it's a thing it's fashionable and I'm like oh my gosh like that's not something to be ashamed Oh, but just celebrate. This is you, you know. Like I don't, you know, like like I like I was saying, I don't have a particular style, or you know, like I don't go for this is my thing, you know. Mm-hmm. I shared it actually on stories. Sometimes I feel like I just love neutral colors and stuff, and sometimes I'm craving color. So that's okay. That is to be celebrated, yeah. and I love that. It is love. to be celebrated. All of us, all of the parts of us, are to be celebrated. And there's other example they're bringing in that I'm guessing is important for someone listening because they really want me to share this is for anyone who has been told that they're too much, that they're too loud. What they are saying is how are your people going to hear you if you don't speak up? Oh, this is beautiful. Yes. Someone needs to hear that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm taking that as well. Well, this is so beautiful, Melanie. Can you please tell us where we can find you? I will, of course, put all your links in the show notes, but where can we find you? 
So there are two places you can find me. That's on Instagram at Melanie Hustis. It's an uncommon name, so I'm pretty easy to find. And then I have a website, MelanieHustis.com. And those are the two places I hang out the most. Well, Melanie Hustis, this was lovely. Thank you so much for this chat. And I look forward to having you back so we can dive into the tinfoil and other things. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone listening. And I will be back next week. Bye for now.